I unequivocally love the Mac. In fact, the Power Macintosh G3 was the first computer I really ever used. Uh, now, I played Backyard Sports and Pajama Sam at the age of five, not fancy compute work. But since then, I have remained a Mac-first computer user. And the shift to ARM processors is one that I've surmised would happen for a few years now. But to finally see these machines in the flesh? <laughs> wow, they are a paradigm shifter. This video is sponsored by Private Internet Access, the internet's favorite VPN. Try it out today and sign up for just $2.08 per month by using my link below. When the M1 Max shipped, I was on my honeymoon, and so I was unable to participate in the initial hubbub of news and hot takes. And save for the fact that I lost a lot of potential views, I am actually quite glad I was gone because I've had more time to spend with these computers and time to realize that these computers actually define an entirely new chapter for Apple, perhaps the first chapter in over a decade since the iPhone's initial launch. It's so much more complex and ornate than this computer is the best thing ever made or this computer is stupid and still has a lot of problems. So let's talk about everything I've learned from the M1 Max over the past three weeks and what I think all of it actually means. Now, this is not a review of any one particular M1 Mac because reviewing them individually just, it doesn't make sense. They're the same computer, at least in essence. You've got the fanless MacBook Air, the slightly thicker and heavier MacBook Pro with a fan you almost never hear, comes with a bigger battery, brighter display, and the unfortunate touch bar. And then you have the MacBook Pro without a screen, AKA the Mac Mini. None of these computers have enjoyed massive redesigns over their prior generations. In form and function, they remain mostly the same, save for the MacBook Air, which ditched its previous fan of questionable utility. Now, the Mac Mini is largely empty inside with a much smaller PCB, but the same blower fan and the same 150-watt PSU from the prior generation. A true testament to economies of scale, because this decision technically makes no sense. The Mac Mini under 100% load barely draws over 30 watts, and they put a 150-watt PSU inside. Only in my wildest dreams did I think that my biggest complaint about a new generation of Apple computers would be an outdated design and larger than necessary form factor. But 2020 has continued to prove itself as the year that defies all odds. So let's not review the aluminum vessels, but the software and the silicon inside these machines that makes it so much more than a mid-cycle refresh. And that is Mac OS 11 Big Sur and the Apple Silicon M1. Now, there will be two videos to tackle both of these subjects because I wanna go more in depth than I've seen in other reviews. So in this one, we're going to be talking about how the M1 plays with the operating system that sits on top. Say what you will about Big Sur's controversial redesign. Look, I'm not the biggest fan either, but the convergence of iOS's design language and Mac OS X's make the new M1 Max feel at home in a way that I don't think they would have otherwise, and in a way that Intel Macs running Big Sur feel a little out of place. For example, the refined login screen lends itself way better to the instant wake nature of the M1. The redesigned Messages app has an instant snappiness, which is really making me reach for my Mac to write longer replies, which is something I would have never dreamed of doing a month ago had my iPad been in the same room or even on the same floor. Thanks to the new Control Center and AirPods automatic switching feature, Bluetooth and AirPlay devices now feel like the magic we've experienced on iOS for a few years now, and not some shoehorned in afterthought like on Macs of yore. But not all is rainbows and unicorns, okay? There are some growing pains clearly visible in the operating system. Several window dialogues just cut off buttons in third-party applications. And a few apps allegedly optimized for Apple Silicon seem rushed out of the gate and laden with bugs that can't be found in the more mature x86 builds. Most apps run amazingly well in Rosetta 2, but several do not. More on that in a minute. Because I first want to talk about the ability to run iOS apps on M1 Max, one of the most surprising and strangest announcements about this rollout. On the offset, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. When all your computers run the same architecture and your mobile platform has hundreds of thousands of high quality apps, why would you not allow them to run on the desktop counterpart? That's a practical move and it bolsters the Mac's usable app catalog. On the other hand, it's just, it's a very weird move to see from Apple because, well, it's, it's not really a great experience and it's generally, in my opinion, pretty compromised. 
One of the reasons why I think that the iPad excelled as the de facto tablet is that Apple didn't really provide an excellent way to use iPhone apps, but bigger. Android, on the other hand, had been designed from the ground up to support different display sizes and aspect ratios. And when push came to shove, it was the iPad that got the new tablet-focused apps built from the ground up, not just scaled up phone versions, which is what Android tablets largely got. If the iPad is not the iPhone, then the Mac is certainly neither of these, as it doesn't even have a built-in touchscreen. Now, some simpler apps like Overcast actually run quite well, better than their browser counterpart. But most apps don't. If an iPad app is available, the Mac will install that version. And when absent, it installs an iPhone version instead. Now, the iPad versions, uh, they're kind of a hit or a miss. Some apps support scaling, while others do not. In none of these apps can you specify orientation, which is annoying, given that some features are locked out accordingly. I have discovered a workaround, which is inside the menu bar, you can click the zoom window setting and it will force landscape orientation in some apps, though it doesn't work in all apps. And when it does work, don't expect it to look awesome. This is a really frustrating omission given that in Xcode's iPad simulator, you can change the orientation of the device. Why not offer it here? I don't know. Well, when there is no iPad version available, it only installs the iPhone version. And holy smokes, that sucks because there is no window scaling. And so you're stuck with this uselessly small, tiny app on such a high resolution display. As for the experience from app to app, well, uh, apps that use the accelerometer, they're clearly out of the question, though many of them are actually still installable, amongst which games, which are available by the thousand, but largely unplayable with multiple input on-screen controls, well, not being available on the Mac. You can't do that on the touchpad. And so the best iOS games for the Mac are those that support the Mac's input methods, a keyboard and mouse, and newsflash, there are basically none. <laughs> now there is a nice catalog of games that do support the Mac uh, with the Mac's input methods, but those are Apple Arcade games, which newsflash are already available on the Mac. Apple has made iOS apps for the Mac opt out, meaning that basically, unless the developer specifies it, those apps will be available on the Mac. That means in theory, there's a large catalog of apps up for grab. However, I have found that most of the apps you would want at least the apps that I wanted, high quality ones, well, they were removed from the App Store by their developers. They didn't want you to install it on the Mac. Instagram, for example, is not available. Now, there is a workaround that allows you to use your iPhone and a piece of third-party software to sign IPA package files for use on your Mac with your iCloud account. And sure enough, I mean, a double click of these IPA package files will automatically unzip them into your applications folder. And they work, but, not well. <laughs> On the other hand, some Mac apps are so bad, and I'm looking at Electron web apps like Slack, that the iPad version works really, really well and feels fantastic on the M1 Macs, despite some weird uh, kind of gesture irregularities and missing hotkeys. Unfortunately, Slack and many others with poor native Mac apps have elected to exclude the iOS version from Mac OS. And I don't know about you, but sideloading apps from my Mac to a plugged in iPhone with every update and manually reinstalling sounds neither practical nor worthwhile. This is not Catalyst, and it's certainly not SwiftUI, the future that Apple has been forcing developers towards. It's a weird stopgap that feels un-Apple, and while in theory it sounds like a good idea to give the Mac App Store a bit of life at the beginning of this new transition, I fear that in actuality it will inhibit and not encourage third-party developers from developing Mac-specific binaries of their popular iOS apps. I guess we'll see what happens. Luckily, there isn't much need to focus on iOS apps while x86 apps make the transition to ARM because basically every Mac app you're used to using is supported on Apple Silicon. Asterisk. <laughs> you see, that's not strictly true, and I feel that a lot of reviewers have neglected to mention and disclose the reality of Rosetta. Just in apps that I use frequently, ScreenFlow, Google Drive, Parallels, and Pro Tools are all completely broken. And a handful of other important applications like Adobe Acrobat, Audio Hijack, Docker, VLC, and Airfoil work so poorly that they may as well be broken too. Now that's not to say that Rosetta 2 is lousy in general. It is not, quite the contrary in fact. However, 
All I'm saying is that if you rely on specific unsupported apps, or more importantly, plan to develop or virtualize anything, hold off for a bit, okay? Upon first launch of an x86 app, or after any major update, the Intel binary has to perform a compile translation session, which means that the app requires basically anywhere from five to 30 seconds to start up. Now, there have been times where I wonder if my computer is just locked up, only to see the Rosetta app launch a few seconds later. It'd be handy if the OS told you this was happening rather than just appearing completely despondent. But luckily, this long startup process is a one-time deal. And after initial translation, apps open insanely quickly and operate just as quickly as well. Even ones that are famous for being slow openers like the Office and Creative Cloud apps. It is particularly weird to see Photoshop launch several seconds quicker on an $800 Mac mini than it does on a $10,000 Mac Pro but such is the world of fast single core chips. And not particularly new, but the M1 unequivocally takes things just to the next level. When actually running apps in Rosetta 2, beyond the occasional bug here and there, typically when it comes to display elements, most stuff runs without a hitch. So well, in fact, that it's basically impossible to figure out whether or not you're running an Intel or an Apple binary. If you're curious about what your system is running, Activity Monitor tells you. And Billy, a follower of mine, also launched an App Store app called Silicon Info that gives you a little menu bar widget with the very same information. And while not likely to be useful in the long term, it can be handy in determining if Rosetta is at fault when you're experiencing weird bugs that rear their ugly heads. Some apps like Google Chrome launched with some pretty severe bugs, but luckily Chrome has already been fixed and it's more than reasonable to assume that the majority of well, supported Mac apps that will make their way over to Apple Silicon will do so more carefully. Even the less suspecting stuff like uh, command line tools. That said, I was surprised at Homebrew, which works along with most of its packages through Rosetta, pretty cool. Now, for apps that are no longer supported, I expect them to work a good long while before they finally bite the dust, as they're all 64-bit applications, so have been updated semi-recently, and Apple not only supports uh, these application types, but also still sells Intel Macs. So we've got a good few years of unsupported Mac heaven through Rosetta 2. Speaking of Intel Macs, many have asked me what has happened or what will happen with Boot Camp, as well as virtualization of Windows and Linux through third-party applications like Parallels. Funny enough, Boot Camp actually ships on the M1 version of Mac OS. However, opening that app, uh, it results in a notification saying that the assistant cannot be used. Then why even include it? <laughs> in the Linux VM department, Apple, Parallels, VMware, and others have all stated that official Linux virtualization will be coming soon to Mac OS. Though that begs the question if said virtualization is of x86 distributions or ARM ones. Likely the latter, as Apple's own Craig Federighi has even stated that Windows on Apple Silicon Macs would certainly be allowed if Microsoft ever got around to it. He told Ars Technica, quote, as for Windows running natively on the machine, well, that's really up to Microsoft. We have the core technologies for them to do that, to run their ARM version of Windows, which in turn, of course, supports x86 user mode applications. But that's a decision Microsoft has to make to bring and to license that technology for users to run on these Macs. But the Macs are certainly very capable of it." End quote. Hmm. Cool. But look, we needn't wait for Microsoft, as with QMU and some hypervisor patches provided by a few developers on GitHub, Windows can easily find its way onto the M1 Macs today. And performance is not only acceptable, but quite good. M1's virtualized Windows performance actually exceeds that of Microsoft's own Surface X running the operating system natively. A little embarrassing for Qualcomm and Microsoft. Speaking of Windows, you can use today's sponsor, Private Internet Access, not just on Windows, but on macOS, Linux, mobile, basically the list of supported devices is endless, including the M1 Mac, which works flawlessly under Rosetta 2. Though I'm sure a native app is on its way very soon. PIA has been the internet's most loved VPN for many years, and it's no secret why. With over 20,000 servers in 73 countries, you can get access to region-locked data, including news, streamed content, shopping sites, and more. One of the things I really appreciate about PIA is the speed. I've had several VPN sponsors in the past that, 
work, but I've stayed with PIA and I'm a paying customer because of one thing, and that is that they are the most reliable and they have lightning fast connections. And they don't seem to penalize transfer rate as a result of peer-to-peer -peer networking, which I don't do, but if I did, boy, that would be handy. Try PIA today and get signed up for just over $2 per month, plus three months free when you use my link. And if you're not happy, there is a 30-day money-back guarantee. macOS users have long utilized the Wine compatibility layer to run Windows apps without needing to boot up a dedicated VM. And it is in this instance that I have been blown away by the extent to which Rosetta can just make things happen. I'll get much more detail on this stuff in my next video, but here's The Witcher 3 running at 768p with low texture details at about 40 frames per second. That doesn't, well, I mean, it doesn't sound that impressive until you realize this. It is a DirectX 32-bit x86 Windows game being translated to a metal 64-bit x86 Mac app through Vulkan, being translated again to run on a 15-watt laptop with an ARM processor with integrated graphics thanks to Apple Silicon and Rosetta 2. Did I lose you there? Well, I almost lost me too because of the insane amount of translation. And look, it, it bloody works. Is it an amazing experience? Well, no, but it works. And that is a testament to the incredible software work that Apple has done and the amazing M1 hardware that I will be talking about in my next video. As for this video, well, we're just about done. What's the most impressive thing in your eyes? Let me know down in the comments below. If you like this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, well, send it to someone you don't like. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, stay snazzy.